I think it's hard to imagine a discussion of race in this country without the NAACP. Uh, if you just start with Du Bois at the beginning, you know, Du Bois alone saying the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color land. When I hear of a lynching, when I hear of what happened just recently, the man who was dragged, it brought it all back. I, and I said, you mean to tell me we were right back where we were at that time? There were soldiers coming back from Europe who were being lynched, who were being killed. Uh, so the contradiction between what the dream was and what the actuality was uh, was sitting in every black man's face and in his chest. We can't wait till the torch gets passed. We'll just we have to go snatch to. it. We'll <laughs> <laughs> In 1909, a group of white progressives, black intellectuals and activists, established the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It was created so that America could fulfill the declaration of our founding fathers and the sacred truth that all men are created equal. We were organized to promote the Negro's rights as a citizen, to uphold the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and to defend him from race prejudice. Those are some of the historic words of Mary White Ovington, one of the founders of the NAACP. Walk a mile in my shoes. The 90-year journey of the NAACP will examine and illuminate the oldest and one of the most esteemed civil rights organizations in the United States. This program is brought to you in part by General Motors. My grandma was a daring young woman, driving her trusty General Motors car to California, then back to New York. That's where she met Grandpa. So when I announced I was off to California in my trusty GM car, Grandma knew I'd be just fine. And so did I. General Motors, cars and trucks you can count on wherever life takes you. People in motion. Around here, it's not every day we all get together. Oh, we're making them dinner. Come on, you guys. Smaller pieces, please. But when we do, it's great that the folks at Kraft make Italian. I love this stuff. Because it's the one thing we agree on. That way, we can talk about what's on our minds instead of what's on our plates. Whose idea was this? Well, Kayla has a boyfriend. I guess they just know what we like. A what? He's a senior. He's a senior. Around here, the dressing is Kraft. I'm Julian Bond, chairman of the NAACP, and this is my co-host, Miss Nancy Wilson. Walk a mile in my shoes. The 90-year journey of the NAACP will examine and illuminate the oldest and one of the most esteemed civil rights organizations in the United States. The mission of change, starting in 1909, was not only dangerous, it was the greatest social challenge of the times, if not the century. Black Americans were treated as inferior, second-class citizens, in every aspect of American life. Race was constructed as a social category in a very meaningful way for African Americans, Native Americans, immigrants for that matter, in a way that dictated their lives. It dictated their everyday lives in a way that the media, the science, and the law shaped people's lives and made people feel that they were inferior. The NAACP 
jumped into the middle of a kind of national atmosphere where the lives of black people were of no consequence, where very few citizens thought that black people had a right to be treated as citizens. And, and what they did was to pull together a small group of blacks and whites to try to take on this immense kind of struggle well, with virtually no hope of winning anything immediately. Uh, and just the idea of it was an extremely bold kind of idea. The United States government and its presiding presidents sanctioned unequal segregation, allowed the blocking of political and economic rights of black people, and worse, did little or nothing to curtail illegal murders of thousands of its African-American citizens. Lynching seemed a common pastime. And to a large extent, this was all predicated about fear, and this was white supremacy. So, of course, it was white legislators, white uh, scientists, and white folks that were controlling the terms and conditions of how the racial hierarchy would play out in American society. So in many respects, it was fear and white supremacy that bolstered these issues. When the forces of the Niagara Movement and the members of the Conference on the Negro joined together, the organizers of the newly formed NAACP had no idea what their impact or legacy would be. The idea for the NAACP came from whites, from well, William English Walling, uh, Mary White Arlington, Oswald Garrison Ballard, who was descended from uh, William Lloyd Garrison. And their feeling was that, in fact, uh, white supremacy was a white problem. And that if white Americans were responsible for racism, they ought to take some of the responsibility for ending racism. The crisis of black Americans was so bad, the organizers didn't immediately know what to do, where to begin, because there was so much to be done. The founders decided to keep it simple. The start of the NAACP was a huge undertaking because part of the science they had to combat was this notion that there were savages, barbarians, and civilized. And they were saying, we are civilized. And they were trying to prove to the world that they could work with white intellectuals, they tried to prove that they had the ability to participate in the democracy that was for all Americans. And so they said, no, we're not savages, we're not barbarians, we are just as civilized as all Americans and we want our rights too. You, the 14th Amendment says all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and the state in which they reside. By launching the organization on the centennial celebration of President Abraham Lincoln's birthday, the founders of the NAACP challenged America to live up to Lincoln's Civil War promise of equality before the law. In 1910, the organization started Crisis Magazine. It became the most influential journal of political, social, and cultural thought ever seen in America. Magazines went from L.A. to Chicago to New York and framed a shared experience for all Americans. And W.E.B. Du Bois knew this. And he said, we're going to do this with the Crisis Magazines. He took the Crisis Magazine National and through various articles, just like many of the muckrackers in the progressive era, used the crisis to dispel notions of inferiority. Uh, at its peak, the crisis had a circulation of over 100,000. It was the most popular magazine uh, among black Americans. Uh, people bought 100,000 copies, but it was read by five times that many people in barber shops and beauty salons and in churches and so forth. Uh, and during that time, it, it had a range of content that covered virtually every aspect of African American life. The publication, which is still published today, served as an intellectual beacon of black insight, cynicism, even humor. The NAACP found its voice and began stating its concerns criticizing American society through the writing of articles, essays, poetry, and prose. President Woodrow Wilson, who won the office in 1912, began to purge black office holders. Jim Crow became the order of the day for federal civil service workers. The idea of racial segregation becoming government policy infuriated the NAACP. They fought President Woodrow Wilson's policy through letters and newspaper campaigns, but it seemed to grow constantly through his eight years in office. President Wilson created one of the great discussions on race when he initially supported and lauded the 1915 silent film, Birth of a Nation. The film, produced by D.W. Griffith, was set in the South after the Civil War and based on a novel called The Klansman. The Q. Klux Klan were portrayed as heroic saviors of a South ravaged by Reconstruction and raped by black savages. 
What that did is it crystallized for millions of Americans stereotypes that were before folklore images, but in living images, it crystallized for millions of Americans these stereotypes that were held in the South for all Americans. So blacks were lazy, they were slothful, they were lusting after white folks. And what this did is it had a sense of truth to it, so people believed it. Does Jesus care? With the introduction to this movie in 1915, you get a whole onslaught of increased mob violence as well as a reorganized and retooled KKK. It spurred more competition in terms of labor, but it also spurred these what they called race riots. But race riots not in the kind of uh, Rodney King or even the Watts race riots. These were more like pogroms in Eastern Europe where people would go into black communities and level them burn, scorch earth policy. They would level complete communities, whether it was in East St. Louis or in Decatur, Illinois. And the Birth of a Nation actually promoted that. The NAACP tried to block the release of the film, unsuccessfully. But the fight against the film helped mobilize thousands of black and white men and women in large cities around the country against the rampant racism and violence depicted in the film. The film is still shown. I mean, the film is, is listed in the top 100 American films. Uh, and if you go to film school, they show it as a great work of cinematography and zoom lenses and cast of thousands. Uh, but the content is just deeply, deeply uh, uh, vicious. In 1915, it was estimated that over 3,000 black men had been lynched since 1889. By 1925, the Klan had grown to nearly 9 million members. World War I started. Black men, for the most part, were considered inferior or incapable of effective combat. The NAACP took action in fighting for the rights of black soldiers. It pushed for their recruitment and attacked any institutional discrimination against them. Sadly, the black soldiers who had fought for democracy abroad found none at home. And what you had were black veterans who were coming back who would not be, you know, bumped off the sidewalk, who would not go shuffle, who would not take off their uniforms and kowtow. In 1919, the race riots in Phillips County, Arkansas, were among the most deadly and brutal. Twelve Negro cotton farmers attempted to seek a fair share of profit for their crop, legally. When a firm of white lawyers took their case, their meeting was attacked at night by a hooded mob, and a deputy sheriff was killed. A reign of terror followed. Close to 300 blacks were hunted down in the fields and swamps and slaughtered. Many had no idea of why. Twelve black farmers were sentenced to die for killing the deputy. Another 67 blacks were sentenced to life in prison for defending themselves. The NAACP was successful in getting the U.S. Supreme Court to free the 12 men. It took another five years before they won the freedom of the other 67 African Americans. Former NAACP Executive Secretary James Weldon Johnson in his autobiography recalled, the red summer of 1919 broke in fury. He wrote, the colored people throughout the country were disheartened and dismayed. Texaco knows that the greatest energy of all is human.
During the first four decades of this century, the efforts of the NAACP to secure the protection of basic rights to life and liberty for black Americans were threatened by mob violence and race riots. From Texas, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, riots increased and spread to the north, including East St. Louis, Detroit, and Chicago. A white mob that included women and children cheered as 19-year-old Jesse Washington was burned alive in a public square in Waco, Texas in 1917. Between this year and 1919, over 200 lynchings were reported. This incredible hatred by whites toward blacks was obscene and seemingly could not be stopped. Local authorities did nothing about what was happening, and since lynching was not a federal offense, neither did federal authorities. We had been hearing about lynchings all the time growing up, but we never heard of any and the place near. When that happened, uh, I remember we were in school, and uh, that morning the teachers huddled and just talked, and we were not taught anything. And there was no explanation given, and we knew something was wrong, but we didn't know what. And we, most of us, went home for lunch. And when we went home, my mother didn't say anything. She had a strained expression. When my father came home, he said, when you eat your lunch, and then I have something to tell you. And one of us, I remember, said, it's bad, isn't it, Papa? He said, I said, eat your lunch. After lunch, he told us that a man had been lynched in Salisbury. And uh, we were shocked and frightened. Lynchings had occurred prior to the formation of the NAACP and continued on through the 1940s. When I hear of a lynching, when I hear of what happened just recently, the man who was dragged, it brought it all back. I, and I said, you mean to tell me we were right back where we were at that time? That, that kind of thing could happen today. That happened that many years ago. The NAACP led a silent march of 15,000 blacks and supporters in New York on July 28, 1917, to protest lynchings and anti-black riots around the country. And so uh, what they staged was not a, a march with a lot of fanfare noise, but just a, a completely silent march with only a muffled snare drum being played as they walked down Fifth Avenue in New York. Uh, with, with thousands of people in that march. It was a very dramatic, very moving kind of scene. Uh, and it helped kind of kick off and, and, and keep going the NAACP anti-lynching campaign. It marked the beginning of the 30 years that the NAACP devoted so much of their efforts to achieve the passage of a federal anti-lynching bill. And a report published in 1919 called 30 Years of Lynching stated that only seven states at the time had not had at least one lynching. Although the fight to get an anti-lynching bill was unsuccessful, the NAACP's protest, public campaigns and investigations led by Walter White were successful in reaching the consciousness of America. And he went around through the South investigating the things and gathering evidence and, and dealing with that stuff, putting his line, life on the line. If, if it had caught him, he would have listened to him. Walter White the NAACP's assistant secretary could pass for white. Shortly after reported lynchings in Aiken, South Carolina in 1926, Walter White, posing as a white man, infiltrated the mob and secured a compilation of eyewitness accounts, which were then published in a series of articles in the New York World newspaper. Through these efforts, the blacks who were charged with and convicted of inciting the incidents which were said to have caused the lynchings were acquitted. When I think of the founding of the NAACP, I do, I think clearly of the lynchings. I think clearly mm -hmm. of how it was common day to be able to just walk down the street and be suspect to lynching. The NAACP created a legal committee in the 1930s to push for federal anti-lynching legislation. After 1940, lynchings continued to decrease to hardly any reported assaults in 1950. The committee was later renamed the NAACP Legal Defense Fund.
but David in a world of Goliaths, Chevy Malibu. With an awesome V6 standard, it has power you can depend on. Chevy Malibu. We'll be there. We are not happy about this. You go, girl. We weren't happy about baking all day either. But it was ours. Stove top oven classics. A one dish oven baked chicken dinner. Sauce, seasoned stuffing. All you had is chicken. Five minutes to make. Ready to bake. A Sunday taste. Tuesday effort. Dagnabbit. What's next? Thanksgiving in a box? Stove top oven classics. Sunday taste. Tuesday effort. We need a martini. Nobel Peace Prize winner, the late Ralph J. Bunch, at one time a critic of the NAACP, noted that in the first three decades of this passing century, the most important of the tactics employed by the NAACP is that of legal redress. The outstanding victories of the association have been in court. By 1930, the NAACP had become effective and powerful enough to initiate strong efforts in challenging several key discriminatory issues, one of the most important being the inequities between black and white schools in the South. It became the opening shot in the long-range battle to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. Education opportunities and equality in learning became primary for the NAACP. The decision in Plessy versus Ferguson said segregation was always separate but equal. Well, Things were separate, all right. Everything was separate, but nothing was equal. So we challenged the equality, you know, inequality, and and that's made it possible for us to garner a reasonable amount of support from sensible white people, and so we only had to fight the segregationists. The Great Depression had taken its toll on the American experience. Blacks were on the cutting edge of poverty and survival suffering to the extreme. The NAACP began to make economic issues more important to its agenda. They were aware that even the New Deal programs implemented to stem the depression exhibited discriminatory practices. The NAACP monitored these patterns and lodged protests with the federal agencies. Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall chose the strategy of the courts for a number of reasons. The first of all was the legislative branch was not available. We know with the anti-lynching legislation it had tremendous support and couldn't get passed. It was locked in, in, in the Senate. The president at that time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, could not budge because he needed the southern, the southern legislators on his side and they weren't going to move. So the executive branch was blocked. The, the legislative branch was blocked, and so the only branch of government left was the judicial branch. And that began to be an important strategy or important front with which the NAACP decided to move. As a reform movement in selecting cases, they set two primary criteria. The issue of citizenship rights had to be involved, and racial discrimination had to be clear. But the challenges remained. The 1936 Housing Act was passed, providing affordable housing and FHA guaranteed loans. However, the government created de facto segregation by developing separate public housing projects for blacks. During the 1930s, women began to play important roles, building memberships at the local branches. Some became branch presidents. 
uh, unique to most black organizations, women were there at the beginning in very high positions. And th you always had uh, an infrastructure of females. But if you look at the chapters throughout the South, there's significant numbers of females who were president of chapters. You know, they were, they were, they didn't have to fight their way and they were there from the beginning. Mary White Ovenkin was there from the beginning. Lily Mae Jackson, Dr. Lily, Ma Jackson, was my paternal great-grandmother. Dr. Lilly uh, uh, was the president of the Baltimore branch of the NAACP for 35 years. When she took over the Baltimore chapter in 1935, the membership swelled to 2,000, and then at its height was up to around almost 20,000, making it almost, the, I think, about the largest chapter of the NAACP in the country. Dr. Lilly Carol Jackson's daughter, attorney Juanita Jackson Mitchell, was very involved in the NAACP. She helped to organize the youth division of the NAACP around the country uh, with Walter White, assisting uh, Walter White. The association developed solid personal contacts with certain leaders in the New Deal administration. Eleanor Roosevelt, in contrast to her husband Franklin D. Roosevelt, in the first of his four terms as president, was openly supportive of the NAACP. Her position represented the new sensitivity to the NAACP's goals and racial discrimination. The NAACP formed a lasting relationship with the Congress of Industrial Organizations, known as the CIO. The organization's policy of organizing black workers was vastly different and more equitable than the concept of Jim Crow exclusion practiced by the then separate AFL. One way to address economic concerns was, in fact, to form an alliance with the, the developing CIO. So, in fact, you could pressure the Roosevelt administration to get more jobs and to get more black people in the jobs. So it represents a kind of response on, on the part of the organization to the Depression. As an ally, the CIO became a proponent of the NAACP push of the Roosevelt administration for a Fair Employment Practices Committee, an agency that would be the forerunner of the Equal Opportunity Section of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This program is brought to you in part by General Motors. See the USA in your Chevrolet. America, the greatest land. The new Chevy Impala LS has better acceleration than the three top-selling cars in its class. So it's only fair to tell you, Sunday drives may last until Tuesday. Let's go for a drive. Impala, we'll be there. A pizza delivery no, guy no, here? No, 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 what no, kind no, of girl no. do you think I am? But it's not delivery. It's DiGiorno. Refresh baked pizza at home. It's not delivery. It's DiGiorno. I'll call you. Early in the 1940s, wartime, it was the height of America's love affair with the movies. It was also the worst time for the imagery of the black person and black life on the screen. Walter White, executive secretary of the NAACP, spent most of the decade committed to change the images that he saw as Uncle Tomism or Mammyism.
fact, his biggest battle was with an actress who had recently won the very first Academy Award by a black performer, playing Mammy in Gone with the Wind, Hattie McDaniel. Reacting to White's campaign efforts and meetings with studio heads, Hattie responded, what do you want me to do? Play a glamour girl and sit on Clark Gable's knee? We knew about uh, uh, all the struggle that was going on. We knew what the NAACP was doing. Uh, we had been to Hollywood with a, with a, a play in 1947. So, uh, and we'd stayed out there four or five months. We knew what was happening. So, uh, it was no surprise uh, to us that the NAACP was actively involved. Uh, we'd been uh, involved with the NAACP ourselves even before World War II. White knew that Hollywood had the power of imagery and the control of stories brought to the screen. And perhaps he felt that this was really the way to change the impressions of black people. But Hollywood's interest was minimal. And it is said that White, unfortunately, chose not to attack the producers nearly as much as he assaulted the great veteran black performers who played the scripts handed to them. The real culprits were the producers. And even after 10 years of his efforts, there was little change. When I came into the motion picture industry in 1949, I was very conscious of the struggle. I was in the middle of it. And my take on it might be a little uh, different from the common take. I had just finished, as had many other people, a major war, a war of survival. It was a war about race. And race was very much on the minds of the general American public. And there were many people, particularly in the theater, uh, who felt that something had to be done to guarantee that uh, America uh, would never indulge in the kind of racism that uh, had just been practiced by Hitler. Uh, at the same time, there were soldiers coming back from Europe who were being lynched, who were being killed. Uh, so the contradiction between what the dream was and what the actuality was was sitting in every black man's face and in his chest. By the late 1940s, the NAACP hit its stride as a full-fledged, multiracial, multifaceted pressure group. Its alliances with organized labor and the Jewish community gave the association broad-based support. Fueled by its past victories in the Supreme Court and challenges to Hollywood, the association gained moral, legal, and social authority to finally dismantle the hypocrisy of segregation. Charles Hamilton Houston, the dean of Howard University Law School, his protege Thurgood Marshall, who had begun their association with the NAACP in the 1930s, and a select group of lawyers formed the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. The effort leading up to the Brown decision was an arduous one. It was almost 20 years. It began slowly but surely with residential segregation. It moved towards equalizing teacher salary pay, and then it became the most important cases became the professional school cases, the medical school and the graduate schools, and then they moved into the series of cases that led up to Brown. And of course, the NAACP got requests from everybody. They wanted them to fight their case. They wanted them to fight their battles. They wanted them to have, they had to sift through countless court cases to choose the ones they could win and the ones that would be landmark. So they chose five of the public school cases, put them together, and that was literally 15 years after they began this, what many people should see it as, as a campaign. With each resulting victory, these attorneys chipped away at the notion of separate but equal, step by step, mile by mile. So I made a plea to, to judge and he said well he'd done all he could what anything further he could do so I said well yes it is judge there's one other thing you can do he said what's that I said you can issue an order requiring for the Negro children go to the white school and oh boy he got all red in the face and bang, raised both hands and came banging down on the desk I will not do it I will not do it and I thought the man was gonna have a stroke. By 1954 the group of cases known as Brown versus the Board of Education had changed America. And remember this, that from time Thurgood and I went to law school in 1930 until we got the decision in 1954, 24 years have elapsed. 
That's a long time out of anybody's life. And we were fighting all that time because we had to fight everything. After all these years, when we got the decision, what we ran into was massive resistance. One morning soon. Even though they were definitely uh, successful in the Brown case, that was in 1954, it wasn't until 1956 that the NAACP filed suit in the Arlington case. There were uh, 22 children and 13 parents, and my two sons were two of those children. When my youngest son, Bernard, started Stratford Junior High, uh, about the second week he was there, when he returned to his seat, he found this in his seat. This was very upsetting to him, and also angered me. My grandma was a daring young woman, driving her trusty General Motors car to California, then back to New York. That's where she met Grandpa. So when I announced I was off to California in my trusty GM car, Grandma knew I'd be just fine. And so did I. General Motors. Cars and trucks you can count on wherever life takes you. People in motion. By the 1960s, the NAACP's legal integrationist approach had been called into question by black activists and radicals who were frustrated by continued poverty and injustice. Oh, I wanna go yeah. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. emerged with the advent of the Montgomery bus boycott. And even though the Supreme Court case, resulting from the boycott, was actually won by NAACP lawyers, Dr. King's new celebrity overwhelmed the event, and the organization's definitive victory went unnoticed. In 54, we thought, well, we won. Well, where's, where is it, you know? And so, of course, you're very impatient. You know, our slogan was free by 63. We were absolutely convinced that in 10 years' time, everything would be done. In this changing climate, the NAACP was seriously challenged by the rise of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, and the resurgence of the Congress of Racial Equality, better known as CORE. Malcolm X also garnered attention from the news media because of his oratory and controversy. Within the organization, the mood was solid and positive. Roy Wilkins, then Executive Secretary, delivered the annual report early in 1964 and said, 1963 was the best year in the 54-year history of the NAACP. With more members enrolled than ever before, with more funds secured than ever before, 
with a broader program of activity than ever before, and with greater forward progress in the general civil rights field than ever before. Late in the summer of 1963, the huge historic March on Washington, with over 200,000 people, offered hope and vision as the masses converged on the Lincoln Memorial. But in sad reality, 1963 was an eventful and ultimately tragic year. Medgar Evers had been murdered in Jackson, Mississippi less than two months before the march. Four little black girls attending Sunday school were dead as a result of a bomb planted in their church. Mr. Wilkins concluded in that same annual report, the outstanding significant fact of 1963 was the awakening of our national conscience on human rights. The police dogs, fire hoses, and bombings of Birmingham laid bare to the nation and the world, the whole despicable system. John F. Kennedy called for civil rights legislation and made a moving television plea to the nation. The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests. Everyone awakened, except the Congress of the United States. And as the nation prepared to give Thanksgiving, Mr. Kennedy was assassinated. Events were demanding change. NAACP Executive Secretary Roy Wilkins led the charge in pressuring Congress and President Lyndon B. Johnson to pass the 1964 Civil Rights and 1965 Voting Rights Acts. The NAACP strategy of using the law as an instrument of change reached its zenith. Blacks really believed that better days were ahead. Many black activists even became elected officials. The social, cultural, and political fabric of America would seem to be changed forever. The group I formed in 1963 was gone, you know, but they still have a headquarters in Baltimore, and they still got membership, they still have conventions. Black Panthers came, gone. SNCC came and gone, you know. I mean, all the things that people like as the alternative are not here anymore, you know, but they weathered the storm. And if you still, it's interesting, if you go to any town today and you get pulled over by a cop or you don't get served in a Denny's or somewhere, you call the NAACP. As the 1960s decade came to a close, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated and the ensuing riots, along with the continuing protest of the Vietnam War, often violent as well, created a social and political turmoil that the NAACP was not prepared for. With all or most of the legal, formal, institutional barriers uh, to black advancement uh, removed, racism remains, white supremacy remains in a more sophisticated, uh, more disguised form. And so the NACP has been grappling with how to struggle against that. There's a lack of understanding about the battle against segregation. And as much as a lot of young people have been raised to think that integration was the goal and not the, the strategy, equal opportunity was the, was the goal. Absolutely. No one ever said, I would, rather look, I would rather sit next to somebody who doesn't look like me than have the chance to, com to compete equally in society. daring young woman, driving her trusty General Motors car to California, then back to New York. That's where she met Grandpa. So when I announced I was off to California in my trusty GM car, Grandma knew I'd be just fine. And so did I. General Motors, cars and trucks you can count on wherever life takes you. People in motion.
After the 1960s, the NAACP, to a certain degree, suffered a crisis of victory in the sense that the goals that it had sought had been achieved with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And so the question was, what do we do now? And uh, the NAACP didn't answer that question as clearly and as smoothly as it should have. Black power, the new call of the people, grew out of social alienation. The NAACP and its integrationist concepts of reason were ridiculed and pushed to the fringes of the aggressive black movement. At the level of leadership, uh, the NAACP did not respond well to its critics. It was on the defensive. And you could start from Roy Wilkins, who was uh, uh, executive director from 1966 to 1977 in the post-civil rights era. He denounced the black power movement, supported the war in Vietnam, denounced the uh, black student activists, uh, and he didn't have to. I mean, these were NACP youth who wanted more activity, who wanted more enthusiasm, uh, who wanted black studies, who wanted to be included in the American institutions. but. Roy Wilkins and other leaders of the NACP and other civil rights organizations were not receptive to this because they had fought their whole lives for integration and black students had achieved integration but weren't satisfied with it. The organization continued to address the issues and challenges facing black Americans. They advocated against the regressive policies of the Reagan and Bush administrations by supporting affirmative action and holding ongoing conferences on developing economic strategies intended to enhance the lives of black people. However, the NAACP for the first time since the 1930s was experiencing internal political strife and a weakening fundraising base that created a severe financial crisis. Board Chairman Murley Evers Williams and current President and CEO Kwesi Mfume put the NAACP on firmer financial ground and Fume has directly challenged the Supreme Court to hire more African-American and minority clerks. He has reintroduced the challenge of Walter White directly addressing the burgeoning television industry to be more inclusive of blacks by offering diversity in the prime time schedules. I see denigration for blacks and I see sometimes that denigration is portrayed by blacks themselves and particularly the young blacks who come along who have no sense of history. And this, uh, this, this really should be one of the prime responsibilities of the NAACP, that it should reach out, use its influence with those in the industry to say, hey, look, we have a special responsibility. You know, you have acquired influence, you've acquired power. You are, you, there are black writers now, black directors, black producers, in addition to black stars and black actors. We have a black responsibility. And that is to tell the truth about our experience in, in here. Last year, I went with my grandmother, who's 83 years old, to her in a life, you know, been a life member of the NAACP for a long time, to her NAACP gathering so I could sign up and get my card and, and become an official. I mean, I guess every black person in some way feels like they're, they belong to the NAACP because the NAACP belongs to us. What has happened is that civil rights has become synonymous with old school, has become synonymous with the past. And there are so many civil rights issues which are still critical to address in American society, but we think of them as uh, issues which are on some other plane. But we also need to start this dialogue on what it means to have the civil rights generation interact with the hip hop generation and to have all of us move forward together. You, you have to illustrate to the people who come behind you that this is how much we did. We're 70 and 80 years old now. We just don't have the wherewithal. We don't have the energy to do the things that we did. Here's your opportunity to pick up where we left off and fight these demons on this end. And I think the NAACP today needs to reflect upon the brilliance of the strategists of the previous generations and work within the times. Uh, so many of the people who we grew up at, you know, you know, who we grew up looking up to, Dr. King, uh, Reverend Joseph Lowry, um, were in their 20s when they were doing what they were doing. Um, they weren't organizing around their generation, they were organizing around ideas.
Imagine if you could harness all the creative energy here. Imagine if you could capture all the wisdom here. Imagine if you could feel all the spirit, all the enthusiasm, all the hope. Life is full of energy, and Texaco knows that the greatest energy of all is human. It'll be good to see Uncle George again. I remember he'd pull up in his General Motors car, and a few minutes later, we'd hear him. <laughs> He taught us about pride and love and about life. He'd say, son, always buy quality and always buy from people that show you some respect. So like Uncle George, I'm a GM man. General Motors, cars and trucks you can count on for all the roads you travel, people in motion. As the country heads into a new millennium and the NAACP approaches its centennial, African Americans have made great strides. So much so that some feel that the time-honored commitment of the NAACP to uphold the constitutional rights of people of color and to defend blacks from race prejudice almost seems outdated. But the fact is that more than any other civil rights organization, it has remained vigorous, clear-sighted, and determined in its response to racial discrimination and hatred. The NAACP's organizational structure, leadership, both past and present, its extensive ongoing membership, and its unwavering commitment to equality has allowed the organization to withstand the test of time through its challenges and critical periods. Clearly, the NAACP exists and continues to afford African Americans a tremendous legacy of determined progressive struggle and a remarkable opportunity to mobilize and nurture its community. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People will continue to demand our country acknowledge its diversity by becoming a more fair and equitable nation for all of its people. I'm Nancy Wilson. And I'm Julian Bond. This program was brought to you in part by General Motors with the participation of Kraft Foods. Let me start with a moment of appreciation for the NAACP. Every time I go to vote, um, I appreciate the NAACP. Um, I would not be able to vote without them, and I appreciate the fact that I have a franchise. And so many of us in the black community don't vote. We believe that it's BS. We believe that we, we just, uh, you know, oh, nothing's gonna change. Well, you know what, things do change. When I look at the founding of the NAACP, I see inspiration for getting off our butts and moving. Get public, let people know that you're still very, very serious about moving forward in terms of um, legislation, in terms of just making a better quality of life for all Americans. And I would say to people out there who feel like they're being kept away to the table to step up, to step up. And as you said, sure, some people need to form other organizations, but more importantly, we have these incredible institutions in our country, whether it's the black press, whether it's the NAACP, whether it's the black church, they belong to us, we have to take them as our own.
That's true. I guess uh, in one respect, we can't wait till the torch gets passed. We'll just we have to go snatch it. it. <laughs> 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 You need, you need an NWCP just as much as you ever needed because we still haven't gotten full civil rights of, of, of Negroes. We're not still part of the mainstream yet. Because in fact, we're not, we're not free yet, you know. And as, the legacy is that as long as we need somebody to fight for us, they've signed on to that. They're committed to that. Uh, and until we win, they will, the legacy is like, they're right there. I think the NACP has a, a lot of work to do and uh, youth would be well served to join the organization uh, and participate in uh, the good fight. And the NAACP is in a position to tell our young folks this is what we must do. And I intend to live to see it happen. Uh, Lily Carol Jackson understood that if you were old enough to stuff an envelope, if you were old enough to hold a picket sign, then you were old enough to be a soldier in God's army. And somehow or another, that may have been forgotten. And that's why I say, if history repeats itself, the NAACP has a bright future if it remembers its history. And so as Du Bois said, the problem of the 20th century will be the pr problem of the color line, the problem of the 21st century will be the problem of the color line. And I only hope that the NAACP will be on the front lines as it's been on the 20th century, will be on the front lines in the 21st century. We need them very much.